Hi, everyone. For uh, those who don't know me, my name is Madhav Rajan. I'm the uh, Dean and the George Pratt Schultz Professor of Accounting at Chicago Booth. Um, this is this is an exciting event, and I'm thrilled that uh, many of you have joined to, to listen to our alum, uh, Scott Tuzel, who's the President and CEO of Converse, for this Distinguished Speaker Series event. So the, the DSS, as you all know, is a longstanding Chicago Booth tradition, and we bring together high-profile leaders from the government, from business, from the community, to the school to share their insights and experience. And we start, launched the virtual DSS at the beginning of, uh, of the pandemic, and we learned a great deal uh, going forward about companies and the response to COVID. And the series was so successful that we started to do both in-person and virtual DSS events kind of going forward. And over the past few years, we've had great chats with lots of alumni, uh, Tom Ricketts of the Cubs, and Mukherjee, JP Gann, Jose Antonio Alvarez, and many others. And just this academic year, we sat down with Marcel Ernie from the Partners Group, uh, Jason Wright from the Washington uh, Commanders NFL team, and Peter May from Tryon. And just last month, we did an in-person event with uh, Howard Marks uh, from Oak Tree. So we're thrilled to have with us today, uh, Scott Uzel. Let me just do a little uh, introduction. So Scott is president and CEO of Converse and where he leads all aspects of the business globally and has recently overseen the company's successful return to the basketball category. So Scott came to Converse from Coca-Cola where he was president of Venturing and Emerging Brands Group and led the development of a portfolio of really high growth brands, uh, Honesty, Zico Coconut Water, uh, Body Armor and so on. Uh, and Scott's done great work in sales and marketing at lots of elite consumer goods companies, uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, Coca-Cola, Nabisco, before he came back to Coke to hold a number of leadership positions there. Scott also serves on a number of uh, boards, including S.E. Johnson. Uh, yeah. He's a member of the Florida A&M University Foundation Board and the Executive Leadership Council. And has lots of other interests as well in Boston, which we'll chat about a bit. Uh, Scott did his BS from Florida A&M and his MBA from the University of uh, Chicago. Thank you very much, Scott, for being with us on this DSS. Dean Rajan, thank you for having me. So excited to be a part of this. Uh, let me start by just asking, could you say a little bit about your journey to Converse? And uh, was this something that was always in your mind? Was it an accident? How did it all happen? Yeah, you know, um, yeah, 20, 25 years of consumer packaged goods, experiences you talked about, Procter & Gamble, Kraft Nabisco, and then most recently before Converse, the Coca-Cola company. And I had been leading their venture capital group for about four years. I really loved the work that I was doing. And as I thought about what was next for me um, in the wonderful Coca-Cola company, I really loved this kind of edge between kind of innovation, future consumer, um, and kind of small but still have scale. And mm -hmm. I was just like, kind of what's next? And everything for me next was going to be running a, a more traditional part of the, 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 the Coca-Cola company. And when I got the phone call and met some really talented people from Nike Inc. and Converse and got the opportunity to work with this intersection of sport, fashion, um, culture, I mean, I, I did a little bit of research and just said yes. Mm -hmm. um, so is Converse the kind of company you'd ever thought that we, you'd be a part of, or was this just spurred by the fact that they reached out to you? That's a great question. You know, I I was I talked recently at a university at a university, and I pulled out my little bit of an analysis I did in 2018 mm -hmm. that said like stay, you know, the course or do something different. And I did this analysis, which ultimately led to a very close score, which led to go to go take the opportunity to Converse. But I will tell you that I didn't even really understand the industry I was jumping into. Um, everything from it's built on organized scarcity, you know, it's not a, it's, you know, the products and industry that I'm in is not one where, you know, 5% of the consumers that walk through this store, they're going to buy this particular sneaker. It's not a product that um, unless it identifies with their affinity, they're not going to purchase. Mm -hmm. And then you couple that with a two year supply chain where you've got to figure out what the trends are. And for, right now we're in 2025, 26 you've got to order all of it and you hope it's all blues and reds or, you know, wide legs or skinny legs or whatever they are. Mm -hmm. And and it's just very different. And it's a lot of art and science, but much mm -hmm. more art than science. So mm -hmm. I would say that um, if you asked me in 2018, I would have said I would definitely be in a consumer facing business, um, but I did not understand the very degrees of moving from fast moving consumer goods to the industry I'm in. So, um, and all I could say is that um, I'm glad I went through door number two 
because it's just a completely different world that has been an accelerated learning path for me for the last four years. And um, I, I, I could have never imagined it. So. So when you took the role, that was, was that just pre-COVID or what was sort of the timing of COVID? Yeah, uh, January of 2019. So I, I, I basically had about 14, I mean, 15 months before COVID um, of leading the enterprise and then going into COVID, which, you know, in some days I'd say it, it made me a better leader, which it did. But sometimes I feel like I lost two years because there's so much of what I love that I do today and what I did before COVID in terms of spending time with my, with my teams, being out in the marketplace, being in our facilities around the world that I did all through this, this Mac I'm looking at right now mm -hmm. that I somehow feel like um, I didn't get the full experience, but mm -hmm. it's been four years and I joined right before COVID. And I, I, not right, 15 months before COVID, sorry. And you've been very, very successful leading through incredible period of uncertainty. Maybe you could just speak a little bit about that. Like, what was that like? What were the things that just seemed to, you know, take you sort of come out of the blue? How did you manage to navigate through all that ambiguity during that period? It, it, you know, it's, it's such a great question. You know, when I hearken back to um, where my head was in kind of January, February, March of 2020, um, so basically, um, you know, if you were to look at Converse's performance for about four or five years before 2019, you know, it was basically growing, you know, one to three percent top line and, and really profitability is kind of flat and maybe eroding. You know, we don't like to say that, but it wasn't where it wanted to be. And so myself and the leadership team spent a lot of time obsessing our consumer and saying, you know what, we're a brand like many brands that have a huge legacy of, you know, we sell hundred million shoes a year um, that everybody loves us. Everybody likes us, but how do we find the few people that love us? Mm -hmm. And let's just spend our hundreds of millions of dollars of marketing against them. And that will pull the vortex of the brand forward. That was the thesis. And we started on that journey where we reset the business in 2019 and we were getting really early signals that Voila, I think we are on to something. We got our stakeholders, our board, our, our board, indirect board members all aligned on it. And we were, we were beginning to see the fruits of our work. And in March 2020 happens. And we thought we were going to forever have an asterisk that mm -hmm. the work that we're doing will never know if it'll ever work. Well, mm -hmm. that lasted for about 75 days. And then the world reopened in the middle of summer of 2020. And frankly, you know, our business is about 35% bigger than it was three years ago, profitability is probably up 40%. Brand love is up um, in most of the top 10 markets that we track. Um, our employee engagement scores have moved all in the right direction. And so really um, COVID accelerated the five-year plan that we put forth to our stakeholders mm -hmm. in 2019. It pulled it forward by two or three years. And so, um, you know, um, and so anyway, so, and I'd say that that's kind of the, the quantitative pieces the qualitative pieces from a leadership standpoint for me was first going through this mode of, you know, you've got thousands of people that every day up until March of 2020, I'm used to walking into the room and I better have the answer. And if I don't, I better almost have the answer and act like I do. And hopefully they'll believe me. Um, really getting comfortable saying, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to come back to that. Or, you know, solving a problem as a, as a team um, versus one where I solve it in a room by myself with a couple of folks, come back with the answer. We really worked it together and left the room saying, we're not sure if this is right. And if it's not, we'll adjust next week. Becoming really agile on how we work. That was something that was a big learning moment that I don't ever want to go back to trying to be perfect or the guy that knows all the answers. Mm -hmm. I think second, um, using that vulnerability, I was taught up until 2019 as a leader that you bring your head to work, you know, and you bring, you know, all that energy to work, but you save your heart and your, 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 your empathy, you know, um, for something else. That's not, that's not appropriate during the day. And um, I really had to learn how to meet my people where they are, whether it's the individual employee or groups of employees, whether it be mental health, social justice, disenfranchisement, distance, because we're not together, just a, a lot of muscles that frankly were super uncomfortable for me to use mm. in the beginning, mm. but got really, it was just, I didn't have a choice uh, and become much more comfortable to be there today mm. as a leader. And then lastly, really figuring out, you know, I love the team that I work with, really figuring out how do you create a global team that feels together when we're not in the same room? Mm -hmm. 
I, you know, this, this model that we had up until 2019, where if, if you're not in the room, then you're kind of not there. And um, I've got to fly to see you in dinner in London or whatever. And really we built a much tighter community globally because we've learned how to use technology and use different methods to bring us together. And so I'm super excited about where we are today versus where we were. Mm -hmm. um, not that I would ever wish a pandemic on anyone, mm -hmm. but I think we're we're in a better place than we were before. Mm -hmm. And do you feel now that, you know, with, with COVID sort of mostly out of the way, are you back to what you used to do before or are you finding ways to combine what you learned during COVID with the practices that you had before? Yeah, well, I, so I'd say this about our culture, a um, little bit to this question and the one you asked me earlier. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I worked at Procter & Gamble Coca-Cola, amazing companies. Um, and you know what? Um, I, I really enjoyed working at the Coca-Cola company. But, um, but you know, I still, you, there was still a different Scott on Saturday than you would get Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. Then I come to an environment where the skate team is walking in the building with their skateboards. And if I were walking downtown on Saturday, I might see them skating through the park. The basketball people that work on basketball are hooping three days a week at 6 a.m. And mm -hmm. the designers, when we have our holiday market, they're already designing something else in their hobby that they sell on the side hustle. And meaning this, this intersection between what people's passion is mm -hmm. and their why, it intersects with Converse. And I've never worked in an environment where that's the kind of world that I live in. And mm -hmm. so I say that to say that um, that was the environment I walked in 2019. And it was so many things that were great about it. But there were some things we could do better. One, you know, if you weren't in the room, you, you always felt you weren't a part of the franchise. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't do a good job that if you're in different time zones or your spatial different distances that you felt as connected. So really what we said coming out of COVID was saying, how do we keep the best of what we were before the pandemic? Mm -hmm. What did we learn that really made us great during the pandemic and put them together? And let's not go back to 2019. But let's look forward to a much better workplace. And so we're still under construction. We call it a hybrid environment that we're in now, mm -hmm. but there are no police. There's no participation checks or anything like, like that. But it's one of fluidity that, um, that hopefully creates an environment that people feel like they can be all that they want to be and be their self all day long. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let me just tell our audience, we have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, folks, please send in questions through the Q&A and I'll intersperse them through my questions and uh, and bring them up with Scott. So please feel free to send your uh, questions in. Um, so we, we had a bunch of questions that came in ahead of time. Uh, so let me start with, with, uh, with what you're doing at work now and then we'll flip to some other topics. Uh, what is your favorite Converse style? Yeah, so I, you know, my favorite Converse style is the Chuck Taylor 70, which is um we call it the CT70 black high tops. Con I, many would say kind of boring. There's a lot of cool styles that come out that that flow through my closet. I have you know probably 50 pairs of sneakers in my closet. But um, but if I'm my go-to is probably a black pair of um of CT70. That's my favorite. Okay. So looking ahead, the question says, what style, silhouette, or innovation are you most excited about right now? Yeah, we have a couple of things coming out that are in. So let me let me back up. I didn't talk about kind of who is our consumer. So when when you when you when you step back and you and you enter a brand like Converse, um, that you know it's in sold in hundreds of every country in the world. Um, and you look at consumer studies, like everybody has a story. I used to wear them. You know, I'm not, you know it's all so very few people say I hate them. But when you got to the point of who loves them, who are passionate about them, who on Friday night, I'm going out on that date, that dinner, that event, I want these, the number is not as big. And so we just said that, you know, we, when you looked at the consumers that we were spending our money on in, in 2018, it was the rock and roller, the skateboarder, the basketballer, the, the, the painter, the, 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 the fashion design. It was just so broad and it was the mom with kids. And so and all of them were right. But the net is when you spend your money, you weren't, we weren't breaking through. So we did an exhaustive research and we said, you know, when you really think about this brand, first, it's the 16 to 24 year old, whether the, the real 16, 24 year old or the 16 to 24 that we all want to be, that's create that's creativities at the center of who they are. And they're inspired by music, art, fashion, as well as basketball lifestyle. So there's this whole fashion that happens when they, the, the basketball players have walked down the tunnel or skate lifestyle. And when you blend that all together, that's, a, that's authentic. That's to the heritage of, of Converse. 
And we just pointed the enterprise against that consumer. And that's really helped us win. So as we think about today, the things that I'm excited about, we have a number of skate silhouettes that, um, that really um, look, work in the performance aspect. If you're skating a bowl, or if you're that 21-year-old young person in Paris or New York or Shanghai that loves the look of, of a skater, that's going to look really good with your outfit. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the basketball styles and stay, same thing with many of our elevation styles that we have. And do you segment customers by like location? I mean, do you think about the customer in Asia differently than the ones in the US or are people sort of pretty much following the same trends? That's a great question. So the theaters of business that we do are worth are kind of regional headquarters. So Shanghai kind of runs Asia. Um, mm -hmm. Amsterdam runs Europe, Middle East, Africa, and then um, North, well, Boston's our headquarters with both North America as well as our global headquarters. I would say this, the world we find is about 70, 65, 70% similar, mm -hmm. but their uniqueness to parts of the world. Like outerwear becomes even more important in Asia, like what's new, what comes out from an outerwear standpoint. Fashion has more of an impact, input, sorry, impact on our consumer in Europe, specifically in Italy, Paris, and London. So they're more fashion inspired, although they don't, they're not running away from sport, but fashion has mm -hmm. to be taken into account. And then mm -hmm. uh, sport lifestyle is a big factor here in North America that hits the trends. But all of those trends kind of go across each other, but mm -hmm. each one has its own kind of preciseness or tent pole. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, a, we have some questions about sort of the choices you made in your life and career to sort of come uh, maybe. So maybe we'll start there. Um, so one of the main questions that always comes up is, uh, how did what you learned at school, at Booth, sort of help you in your life? Do you feel that it played an important role in sort of the decisions you made and the career that you've had since? Yes. <laughs> no, I'll give you <laughs> more about that. I would say this. It's a really good question. And I spoke at another business school recently and I was asked that question. And someone said, well, you, you had the perfect career path to right where you are. You mapped it out perfectly post-business school. <laughs> And I, I, you know, and I said, thank you. And I, and I knew that wasn't true. Had a lot of luck in it. But um, what I would say is this, is that I don't know if the business school makes the person or business schools pick really good people that are on their way to greatness and they mix the two, but somehow they come together. But what I can tell you from a Booth connection, for me, a couple things. Before I went to Booth, I worked in sales at Procter & Gamble and loved what I was doing. And when I went, my two years at Booth opened my aperture of the many different aspects of business and the roles that I could play within it. That's kind of one. Number two, the learning environment that gave me, I, I like to call it like how many times I was at bat. Like mm -hmm. if you're a great you know, major league baseball you know, hitter, you've got to see a lot of curveballs and sliders and fastballs that you get to what I've seen this pitch before. Mm -hmm. It's two years at Booth, um, which was called GSB. So I'll date myself when I was there, you know, just gave me so many different looks from buying companies, closing facilities, building cultures, thinking about strategy, analyzing deals. And I, you know, and did all of it, you know, B minus as a student. But when I came out of business school and as I progressed my career and got into different situations, it wasn't my first time hearing about it or seeing it. And I can mm -hmm. harken back, it sounds, you know, trite. I can harken back to that class and kind of remember that when you were working on deal I never for working on a $4.2 billion deal at my prior company. And it was the right brand, right strategy. The economics look right. Myself and the senior executives were flying up to go meet the founders for the last time. And we get back on the plane to come back. And we just said, not a cultural fit. And I mm. remember my professor at Duke, first name Toby, who taught a strategy M&A course. And he kept talking about that, you know, what kills deals is not the analytics of it, it's culture. And when I was 29, 30 in business school, I was kind of like, that's so conceptual. And here mm -hmm. I am flying back from a, a deal in London, and we're going to walk away from all this profit pool opportunity because we did not believe we had a cultural fit. And mm -hmm. we were right. Like we, mm -hmm. it was not even a discussion. And it's mm -hmm. just like, um, you know, it's just that that's what I found fascinating. And even to today where I've been in situations where we're opening a facility in another part of the world, we're closing a facility or doing a deal analysis. I've got 23 direct reports and there's no way I've worked all those different functions, but mm -hmm. I've been through 
parts of it through my business school experience that at least help me ask good questions mm -hmm. so that I can at least make sure as we, I sign off on this legal agreement or I sign off on this plant closure um, that I've asked the right question. So mm -hmm. I would say that um, open the aperture um, got a lot of, you know, looks at bat. And then lastly, met a whole lot of talented people that I bumped into throughout my career that have been mm -hmm. super helpful to make sure that um, I continue to grow and develop. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, what you, so question has come in. What do you think is the most important career path you took to become a CEO? You know, it's a great question. I would say this. Um, you know, first, um, somewhere about 12, 12 to 14 years ago, um, I figured out that if I was going to be happy in what I want to do, I was going to have to bet on myself and make decisions with not all the information. And because um, I basically my first 10 to 12 years out of college, I tried to be perfect. I basically said, you know, Bob or Susie, they're five years older than me and they're really successful. I'm just going to do what they did and I will achieve what they did, what they did. And that's what I did through school. And that really worked. And I'm a firstborn. So I'm following all the right protocols. But at some point after 10 to 12 out undergrad, like that's not a winning strategy. And, mm -hmm. it, and it, no one told me that, but it takes courageousness. It takes believing in your ideas that when there's no right or wrong answer, and it takes putting yourself against that idea and put yourself out there. And so a couple things for me about 10 to 12 years ago, it's funny with Facebook, you know, it goes like Facebook memories. And so mm -hmm. I, I harken back, I got my first baby CEO, CEO job actually nine years ago today because it came up on Facebook that I was getting on a plane to go to Thailand to see my first plant of a coconut water company that I became CEO of. And I'll never forget that um, the, the way I got that job was I left the Coca-Cola company two years earlier to go work at a beverage startup that Coke had a minority investment in. And, and Coke was an amazing company. They, talked, they tried to talk me out of it. My in-laws were like, I can't believe we're gonna leave Coke to go work for a little coconut water company in Southern California. And I remember saying, I believe in the brand, believe in the proposition. I'm going to go work for the founder and I'm, we're going to do great things. And if I'm wrong, I'll go do this somewhere else. And that's kind of what I thought. And I went to do that. And then two years later, Coke buys the company. And mm -hmm. then I'm working for Coke, running the subsidiary. And then I'm asked to be the CEO of the company. And then six months later, they asked me to be the head of the venture capital group. And now I'm doing deals. I did 16 deals for $7 billion over three years. And you know, building brands for the future, which led me to a talk at the Consumer Electronics Show and a couple of Nike um, board members in the audience, which led to, do you want to be CEO of Converse? And so all I'd say is, but what I can tell you about this is all of those moves, I wasn't thinking about three moves later. Mm. I just was excited about the next move and mm -hmm. placing the bet. And all mm -hmm. I say to myself, I'm just glad that I did that. My only regret is I wish five years earlier I did what I was doing for the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. I would have had even more fun. Yeah. So that was the other question that came up, which is knowing what you know now, what professional decision that you made would you have made differently? Yeah, what I would say is this, is that so I would have, I, did, I know I was the first firstborn, still the firstborn, um, but I didn't realize I had firstborn traits to a fault um, because parents said, you're, you're amazing wife, everybody says you're amazing. So I just continued on. And I just wish that somewhere between seven to nine years out of undergrad, I figured out that I'm going to take a non-standard path and start betting more on myself. And mm -hmm. you know what? It, what I learned about all of this, is if you make a mistake, it's like it might be six, nine months, a year of bumpiness, but you're, as long as you have your health and you're smart, you've got a great degree from Booth, I mean, you can still, you can recover, but it's like to not take those chances, you're just missing opportunity. And it's not about financial opportunity. It's just the reward of betting on yourself. And it's like, I, I'm a downhill skier, but it's taking that double black diamond and the way you feel when you get down after you were, you know, almost lost it, you just feel, you just feel strong. And so anyway, I, I'm super excited about that. And I'm just, but what's interesting about it all is that the analysis I did four years ago to stay or go, um, it was like a point close. Like it's like 7.8 to 8.5. But I will tell you this, after going through door number two, it was 7.5 to 60. But I did, I would have never known if I didn't mm -hmm. put myself out there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Great answer. 
So we have some questions coming in more about the business. So maybe I'll shift there. Uh, question about supply chain and all the reshuffling that's happening. Uh, how do you see that affecting Converse? Yeah, I would say there's, um, you know, we clearly had um, like everyone supply chain backlogs. I'm, I, I'm like time warped. Um, I guess maybe a year, whenever you were reading about it, we were going through the same thing. At some point in the last six to nine months, what actually happened is that we we're always backed up, backed up, and then it all came in. Hmm. And so then the thing about it is, um, so now we're back to a world of, um, of certainty around the supply chain. Prices have come down in terms of moving goods around, but it's really some of the bubbles that happened in the last 18 months, we're all working through that in the industry. We're mm -hmm. actually in a very good place as a brand because our brand is on trend and we've had strong growth. But um, but the net is um, the supply chain compared to where it was 18 months ago, we're in a better place. And, and you're not planning to do any huge changes to it. Like, you know, some companies are thinking about, you know, sourcing in different locations, things like that. Well, you know, we're always looking at our supply chain to identify if we should diversify um, can we serve our consumer closer to market? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times in my industry, a lot of the manufacturing is done in Southeast Asia, which is amazing. But, you know, it, it puts, you know, months of supply chain for North America and South America. You really ideally want to have a situation where you have um, flexibility around the world so that you can be closer to consumer trends. So what I'd say is we love the supply chain we have, but probably if you look at the next five to seven years, you're going to see different pods of development that enable us to get closer to the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, another question coming in says, as the market caps of all the major sports teams are you know, going sort of crazy, right? They're going a lot. Does Converse intend to be sponsor of a basketball or a soccer team of even, or even of players themselves? So um, today we are sponsors or we're, we, we, have, we have partnerships with five or six NBA players. So Draymond Green, Kelly mm -hmm. Oubre, Shai, uh, there's a number, the number one most fashionably dressed NBA player is actually a Converse player. Mm -hmm. um, in the WNBA, we have Natasha Cloud. And then we make skate products, both performance as well as, um, um, you know, lifestyle. So we have, we endorse them. So we don't endorse teams or we don't, I, I don't, the question was, um, we don't own yeah. or, or invest in teams or stadiums. What's really mm -hmm. key is that is you, if you look at our collaborators and our partners, is that we really look at the DNA of, it's not only their performance either on the court or on the pitch or on the bowl, but how are their influence in terms of their creativity around lifestyle, fashion, music, and art? And a lot of our athletes, their, their secret passion, or as one athlete not to be named said to me, Scott, I play in the NBA so that I can make clothes to go on the runway in Paris because I love fashion. And so you will find that will be much more of a, a target collaborator versus maybe a player that says, I just want to dunk on everyone or I just want to be number one. Not that we mm -hmm. don't want that, but that's not yeah. our support. <laughs> so this is maybe related. The question is, how do you think celebrity endorsements could be used most effectively by Converse? You know, for us, when I th we think about celebrity endorsements, we, we think about clearly their following is driven by their original craft, whether it be skate, basketball, et cetera. But then getting into how much creativity in the world, art, fashion, music, is a part of what their, their love and passion is. And then lastly, what are their values from a purpose standpoint? And what was amazing during the pandemic uh, of many of our, um, our partners who were not playing because sport had stopped, mm -hmm. they still were out there fighting for social justice, fighting for mental health. And we continue to be a part of that story. And it's not about the story, they're wearing it. So we want them to sell more sneakers. We just want to be supportive of things that are important to our employees, to our stakeholders, and to the people who love the brand of Converse. They expect that from us. Mm -hmm. uh, question is, what does the future hold for fashion as populations, particularly in parts of Asia, increasingly skew older? I mean, how do you think about that, uh, that demographic, if you will? Yeah, you know, um, that's a great question. Um, you know, we continue to follow our, you know, our, our, our muse or our consumer that we, we're just maniacally focused on. We have something called All Stars, kind of Converse All Star, and what that is is that um, we have All Star community of about twenty five hundred young and passionate creators from Lima to L A to Shanghai to Johannesburg. They're in about twenty five cities around the world, and they are micro influencers that are a DJ, a fashion designer, you know, a musician, architect. 
but in their community, they have an impact. And so we stay connected with them to make sure they keep us real and relevant so that we don't become a brand of yesteryear. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we don't um, follow consumers that are my age or others, but if we can follow that 16 to 24 year old that wants to drive progress through creativity, we believe we'll still be relevant with everyone. Uh, a couple of questions about just the market itself. How do you see sort of the global competition now compared to say four or five years ago when you took this role? Yeah, I'd say this, um, four or five, you know, compared today versus four or five years ago. Um, digital and omnipresent, um, you know, connection with the consumer is even more important. Consumers want to be able to do research on their mobile device about your product or learn about it, follow it. That might lead them to actually a physical experience where they go in a store and try it on and see it and touch it. But they might say, I don't want to take it home today. And then in the store, they want to be able to order it and have it shipped to their home so they don't have to deal with it. And so being able to offer a seamless, frictionless experience digitally that's connected with a physical experience is even more important today than it was five years ago. I, you know, it's funny now, I was talking to my wife you know, kids, spring breaks coming up and we, we got to think about like, we had to do a family inventory, like who's got packages coming? It, it's mm -hmm. kind of ridiculous now. It's like, I don't remember this in 2018 because we're just like, we're going to be gone a week. And it's like, do we need to get the neighbor's kid to come over? Mm -hmm. They're going to be away too. And so this whole thing of, um, you know, kind of, you know, online and digital and, and, and connecting consumers that way is just so pervasive. It's just, it's, mm -hmm. it's table stakes today. Whereas then mm -hmm. it was still it was still part of our life, but not nearly to the level that it is today. Mm -hmm. So the audience may or may not know that you are uh, a subsidiary of Nike, right? Could you explain how does that work? Do you take advantage of them? Are you pretty much autonomous, or how does the relationship function? Yeah, so um, Converse is the only wholly owned subsidiary of Nike. Uh, the quick background is Nike purchased Converse in two thousand and three. And well, clearly well before I'd ever was a part of it. But um, and at that time, um, Nike had a strategy. They were buying brands. And I don't know if it was to diversify or to experiment, but they had brands like Umbro and Colhan and Starter and, you know, and several others that I can't. And they've all since sold off. So we're the only one that's still left. And so that that's kind of the backstory. And so today we and, and Converse was founded in New England when they were purchased they were headquartered in Boston and we're still there. And so, and it's interesting about Nike's relationship with Converse is that our retail stores, our digital execution, our supply chains, everything is separate. Our governance, we follow the same governance to ensure that we're operating at the highest standards. And then, the, but the we've kind of flipped it on our back and our kind of re, our, our build back strategy for Converse in 2019. We said, we're gonna get really maniacal on the consumer and then we're gonna take, take advantage of our unfair advantages. From my standpoint, Nike is a one of one in the industry in terms of market cap, in terms of brand obsession, I could go on and on and on. And I'm like this, if any of my peers that are like the two to $10 billion footwear and apparel companies were out there and said, you know, for two weeks, we'll give you a free pass. You can go to Beaverton, Oregon and walk the halls and learn about sports marketing, consumer insights, digital execution, brand building, storytelling, and then you can take it with you and use that mm -hmm. to go in in the marketplace. Every CEO would kill to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually get to do it and do it legally. And so um, <laughs> we build our strategy, um, myself and a select group of our team identified the three or four areas that we believe gives us an unfair advantage versus our competitive set, which is kind of that middle market, you know, three to $10 billion companies. And we, and we leverage that in the market, whether it be sports marketing, um, um, consumer insights, digital execution and learning, although we use different platforms, storytelling, I mean, on and on and on. We don't take on too much. Mark, I mean, Nike is a $240 billion market cap company that if we take too much, it would crush us. But mm -hmm. identifying those two or three things that we can leverage, um, we try to give ourselves an advantage in the market. Mm -hmm. oh, great answer. Uh, so we have a question that maybe relates more to your prior life, which is uh, investing in a startup consumer retail brand seems very risky. How do you think about sort of the, what are the signals that you look at making an investment like that? And how do you think about de-risking your investment? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, 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 so for four years, I, for longer than that, because I left five or six years, I did that. Well, we learned that basically about 97% of the beverage brands that were purchased by big companies 
never delivered their business case or went out of market, went out of business. And Coke had like 30 of them that were in the cemetery and every big company did. And, and the numbers hold true, whether you're in health and beauty aids or, you know, laundry detergent, et cetera. So that, that was one. So two, um, we figured that because we were the biggest beverage company, we could take it from a 95% failure rate to maybe an 86%. So we, we, it was just a little bit better. The piece we, we ourselves and Bain had figured out was that we were so big that we, we actually could keep the businesses going longer, but which just meant we would lose more money <laughs> because we could afford to go two more years, but the consumer stickiness would not be any better. And so, mm. so what we focused on was saying, um, first, you know, what brands have been in the market like more than four years in the market and it achieved $25 million of discrete revenue whether that be in a channel, whether that be in one market, but a densely focused revenue. So it's not spread across a big mass merchant desert. That way we can analyze repeat consumer rates, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. Second, if we invested in those, we actually got to something called proof of concept and the success rate went from three or 4% to 28% by doing that. So brands mm -hmm. like Honest Tea, um, Body Armor, Vitamin Water, many others that had hit that threshold. And that was the sweet spot to take a minority stake in a company. Then if the company actually got to 100 million in sales and had been around six years, their, their success rate doubled and the ability to scale it would go much higher and on and on and on. So we kind of built that curve. Wasn't always perfect, but looking at the consumer adoption, uh, making sure they had a unique way of connecting with consumers, each one of mm -hmm. those brands built a sticky way to do that. Last, thirdly, can they make money if you actually scale it? And then is it something that we thought had an enduring property? So it wasn't just something that was, you know, fickle for two or three years. And you mm -hmm. combine all of that, we thought that um, if you look at the quant in terms of where it fell in the curve and then get into the strategies, things I just identified, we felt mm -hmm. like you have a much better chance of having successful brands. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Um, let me shift topics just a little bit, uh, Scott. Uh, say a little bit about what Converse is doing in terms of ESG or social impact. Is that is that important to you? What sort of role does that play in the way you manage the company? Yeah, you know what? Very important. What I, you know, it's funny being the role that I'm in, and I spend a lot of time with a lot of different employees. It's that, and and what comes up uh, with a lot of employees. And one employee said this to me about six months ago. He, he, uh, his spouse had got an amazing job and he was having to move. He's got to leave the company and he's very marketable at what he's doing. And so he's had lots of job opportunities, but he said to me, he said, Scott, you know, this is a bittersweet. I've been here 12 years, love working here. Converse is my why. And I, I said to him, I said, say more. What do you mean by this? He said, Scott, it's like on issues that are important to me, that are really important to me, that are, you know, kind of outside of work, they're really important to this company whether it be around sustainability, I know behind the curtain that we're working to try to have the least amount of impact in the world. We are not there yet, it's not the finish line, but I know that we are spending an ordinary amount of time focused on what's right, profit aside. And that's a big why, as this person talked about. Mm -hmm. um, making sure we're driving an inclusive environment, both you know, how are we making sure of our self-representation? Uh, how do we invest parts of our profits to the to organizations that matter most that are going to make the world a better place? And how we're working as a leadership team every day to move the line that everyone feels like they can be 100% of who they are when they come to work. And, you know, I'll tell this last story and I'll avail it because it's, it's just, you know, it's just one of those ones that really shook me. A person um, it had been working at Converse three or four years and, and shared a story with me recently and said, you know, Scott, I, you know, I'm 35. I worked at four companies since I've been out of undergrad. Um, I've always had an A and B life. Um, and I was comfortable with that, but you know, just I just thought that's the way it was. And I was, I, I trained myself to be that way. 10 days after working here, my B life came out in my A life, and I didn't even plan for it. And I remember when I did it, no one blinked. And then I kept saying, I, I don't have to be that anymore. Mm. Said, and, and this is my why. So I'd say this when, you know, there's a lot of things we do that come out on our impact report. Our most, our future one comes out in March for 2022 that will go into a lot of specificity around sustainability to our, what we're doing from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint, all the things that matter most. But those are snippets of why that um, 
that this is in the DNA of our brand with our employees. And it's also very important to our consumers every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm storytelling. Last story, I never forget that when I joined Converse, so I started in January, 2019, it's now um, March and I'm sitting with my CFO, our planning team, some strategy people, and we're going through um, both black history, um, Latinx, and then pride that's coming up. And we have products that are tied to that community, made by the community for the community. And I remember that our planning and our um, and our finance people said, you know, while it was such a success last year, we're going to have to take it back this year because we don't want to be ever um, taking advantage of the communities that we believe we're here to support. And, I, and you know, I'm not saying that my prior world was different. I just had never been in a meeting where you had something successful and it was actually almost too successful that mm -hmm. this year we're going to actually go back the other way because mm -hmm. we don't even want to give the illusion that we're taking advantage that we're that the why is not why we get up every day. Mm -hmm. And interesting, one says that, well, you're saying that you all are not for profit or no, no. It, what's really smart about the folks that I work with is that they get the more authentic your why is, mm -hmm. the more powerful the brand is forever. If you take advantage of the why for profit, you're just, you're just, you're not, you're not real. And so it, it's pretty cool. Do you have other brands that you think are doing a good job in, say, sustainability, like whether it's in, you know, fashion or footwear or any of any other field? You know, I, you know, one that, you know, this, this is, um, you know, shameless, but I'm going to say Nike's an industry leader in this deal. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting being a wholly owned subsidiary with um, a lot of independence with some governance structure that keeps us together. But it also means that, you know, sometimes they can do things we can't afford and we just have to say we can't do that. And so, mm -hmm. but the net is we look to them kind of like saying as industry leader, that's always pushing the envelopes, that's made targets out there against water, against waste reduction, carbon reduction, chemistry use, looking at new different materials that can have less impact on the environment, but still to drive performance and fashion, but it might not come from the ways we've always done it. That's the one we think sets the bar and many industry third party says that, although we're part of the same family. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this question, I'm not sure you'd agree with the characterization. The question says, why did you choose to focus on building a stronger connection with your best customers versus acquiring new customers in new spaces? Like how did you go about with the thought process? Yeah, great, that's a great question. So I, I would say this, you know, we didn't, we didn't sit there and say our best customer because the thing about it is the best way I can characterize it we had a lot of consumer targets. So basically each theater of the world figured out who their consumer target before I got there was, and they, they all had three or four. And so we basically are in four or five theaters, and then you take the hundreds of millions of dollars divided, we were never having any one impact in anywhere. So, and and I, I the metaphor I used to use is that we all agreed that we were going to, to Massachusetts, but we didn't agree that we're gonna be in excess. We were all gonna go to Chicago, but we didn't agree we're gonna go to Hyde Park. And we just mm -hmm. wanted laser focus on Hyde Park. And we felt like if we could win and, and, and celebrate Hyde Park, it'd pull all Chicago with it. So it was not so much that it was um, an existing great customer. We had a lot, I could have picked any of them. I'm not saying all of them would have been successful. My only point is all of them were good consumer targets. Um, it was just like, which one are we gonna focus on more and obsess and learn more about? Have them inform our innovation pipeline be a part of our storytelling and on and on and on. We felt like that was the best one. And it comes with its own challenges. If you look at the last four years, we've been well, better. We've had more success than we ever anticipated, but we've been a brand that has been more biased on female than male. So we've got some opportunity to bring more males along, but, um, but it was a good bet because the big takeaway that if I'm anybody on this webinar and they are in the business of focusing on consumers is just spending that time up front of getting laser sharp on the consumer just always pays dividends or consumer or B2B. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you characterize your leadership style? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So I would say this, you know, it was interesting walking in the Converse. So I did that analysis at Coca-Cola. I then joined Converse in January. Nike is based in Oregon. So my boss is in Oregon. Um, I start out in Boston. I don't have a boss. And, and he, he's a great guy, but he didn't work in, in Massachusetts. So he could have come to work, but he wouldn't have really known anybody. He would kind of, 
I think that's your office. So I kind of started on my own. And then I never forget that I'm six weeks in and I'm in a meeting where we just gone through a design review of the products that are coming out in 2022. So two or three, mm-hmm. two or three years later. Mm-hmm. And again, I thought it was a part of my orientation, three or four days of consumer trends and futures insights and touching fabrics and looking at color and jeans are going to be wide leg and blah, blah, blah. I thought it was all really cool coming from the soft drink industry. And then I sit down with the CFO and strategy and they said, okay, we're going to now spend hundreds of millions of dollars to order everything you just saw. And it'll be here in two years. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like I saw very little data. I saw a lot of really cool, smart people, but I don't understand. And I remember calling my mentor that evening and he said to me, and he's a former CEO of a Fortune 100 company. And he said to me, he said, Scott, you're kind of in a pickle right now. He said, you have two, two options. One, you can slow the offense down, like the whole company, bring it to a screeching halt so they can you know, ask him a million questions, give more decks, give me more analysis and you know, basically kill the culture. And, and, and to, so you can feel comfortable that whatever you're gonna do is the right thing to do. Or you can trust your team and ask some good questions mm-hmm. Just say that you're not going to slow the offense down. And his metaphor was spend less time trying to get the right decision, spend more time figuring out if the decision is a, a glass ball or a rubber ball. A glass ball, if it falls to the ground and you got it wrong, it does not come back. You should have a meeting and spend a lot of time on that. That's about 15% of your decisions as CEO. 85% of your decisions are rubber balls. They're, you don't want to make a lot of bad, bad decisions, but you make the wrong decision, it will come back again. So with that principle, I spent my first six to nine months in my leadership style, trusting my people, make sure I got the right people in the right jobs, asking good questions, but not slowing the offense down and separating decisions from rubber balls to glass balls, Mm -hmm. only slowed the offense down for the 15% of the things that I thought needed more attention Mm -hmm. because I wasn't caught up, but the 85%, I trusted their judgment. I was super lucky. Don't know if I took another CEO job. If that's the best plan, but that worked for me, it would have been disastrous if I had asked, if I had been the perfectionist I was seven years earlier, asking a million questions, everybody else knows the answer but me, and I slow the whole company down. Mm -hmm. Uh, You you mentioned a mentor, but you don't have to name the mentor if you don't want to. Are there leaders that you admire? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, this is just legitimate. I mean, I just, um, you know, Mark Parker, the CEO, I walked in. He, he talked about something about um, edit to amplify. And, you know, and, and he, he wrote a note to me because he was in Oregon. He's the chairman and CEO of Nike at the time, no longer chair, no longer CEO now. And he just said, Scott, you know, focus on these five things and keep editing to amplify. And I didn't understand, I'd never heard that concept, but his piece was that every great plan can be tighter and then get to the few things and then throw everything at it. That always stuck with me. And then John Donahue is our CEO now. He spends, and he, and he came from outside the industry. He spends 85% of his time focusing on leadership and culture. And it's funny that I, I remember business school, it's a post-business school, you know, we'd go through the numbers, we'd go through the strategies, go through the capabilities. And then the last page was people and culture. Mm-hmm. I always thought that was like, you, you're supposed to have the last page. For him, it's the first page. He mm-hmm. basically says, if I can work on the engine, we'll run fast. I'm not going to focus on the speedometer, how fast we're running. And that is what he does every day. And it's it's a mind shift that's very different. And both of those are ones that I'm working every day. I'm a natural one to look at the speedometer. And if it's not faster, then push the gas down mm-hmm. versus spending time in the engine, which is not sexy. And then if you get the engine right, you don't have to look at a speedometer because you're going to run fast. Mm-hmm. So, I admire that. And then the rubber ball and glass ball was really prophetic for me because I literally, you know, went through the first six to nine months where it's interesting that you've got a significant title and and I'm in a world where everybody, you know, kind of works for me and they're looking to me to make decisions. And, um, and you don't feel like you're comfortable. Like you don't feel like you have everything you need because you're new to the industry. You're still trying to ask the right questions, but I knew one thing I didn't want to do. I did not want to slow the offense down. And so I just said, if I was going to go out, meaning this is just unplugged, if it was not going to work, I was Mm -hmm. going to do it through being proactive and aggressive and assertive versus one of paralyzing the organization Mm -hmm. and we're missing dates and everything else because I'm trying to be perfect. Scott, 10 years earlier, seven years earlier, my 360, 
I was trying to be perfect, trying to be firstborn, trying not to make a mistake. That would have been a disastrous plan, you know, four years ago when I took over Converse. So uh, could you speak a little bit about what are your passions outside of work maybe? And how do you sort of align that with uh, what you do at work? I mean, do you, do you, are they separate? Do you bring them together? How do you do that? I bring them together from the standpoint that first uh, family, wife, kids, dog, the whole nine. So I've got that piece. Love sport, you know, um, play sports. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I tell the story about when I was interviewing, you know, to, to take the role and meeting with folks I hadn't accepted yet. And I was with the CFO of Nike Inc. And we, it, was like an inter, it was like a discussion interview lunch before I was going to catch my flight out. And, he, and his, his EA said to me, hey, Scott, you know, he's only got about 45 minutes. He needs to run in 45 minutes. And it was like one o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the afternoon. And, you know, my P&G Coca-Cola experience, like, okay, he must have a really important meeting analyst call. Well, I'll make sure he's back by then. So we get back. And as I'm picking my stuff up, I see him go in his office change clothes and he's got his running gear. He's about to go do 12 miles. And it's like, so this, the, 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 in our world that we live in today, we expect sport, fitness, you know, a, a lifestyle of being a part of the culture is we want you to live that every day. It makes you authentic and it's just who you are. And so to me, it's a fusion of that. And it's, it's funny up until four years ago, I had those things. I just talked about them during my business day mm -hmm. And I thought that was a fusion of me and the work. Now, you know, I come in the work in running clothes and I go work out during the day and I go to basketball games in the Super Bowl. I mean, it's like, it's just a fusion. I'm at the fashion show or whatever. And I, I just love every minute of it. Mm -hmm. uh, related question, how do you balance setting aside your time for creativity versus time for executing things? Yeah, great point. Um, first, putting myself in uh, uncomfortable situations. I naturally gravitate to more the quant, the traditional strategy business side of things. I have wonderful people that that work that can work on the other side that in the beginning made me feel really uncomfortable, but I'm glad they did. Mm -hmm. So I make sure I spend a lot of time with our consumers, um, spending time out in the marketplace, living the life or being a part of the lives of the people that we're here to support and be a part of their life. And that drives my creativity. It makes me think about things differently. And it keeps me on a learning agenda forever. And I, that's the part I really love. Um, any book recommendations? You know, I, I read an amazing book that's called the, um, the, the, oh God, it's called Essentialism. It's the Pursuit of Less. And it's like, it, and it's an amazing book and it changed my life. And it talked about that when you're, you know, just talked about great people, great people get more. And whether it be more stuff they buy or people want to give them more, they want them to speak at things or they want to get invited to things and their lives are not very happy. And it talks about people and happiness is really the endless pursuit of less and finding the few things that matter most to you. And how do you relentlessly every day say no to 80% of the things that come your way? Mm -hmm. Focus on the 20% of the things that are high leverage that are most important. It's called essentialism. I've had the author in to speak to our teams, but mm. it will help you in your school, work, and, and personal life. It's pretty amazing. Okay. Uh, we had a question come in about any trends that you're seeing in the economy that could be more incorporated into fashion, consumer products, things like that. Wow. Any trends do I see specifically in the economy? Um, you know, I talked about digital, um, yeah. consumers want it now, you know, it's just the thing about it is whether it be predictive analytics or, you know, AI, there's going to be consumers are going to expect more. They're going to expect that, um, that, you know, when they show back up at your, your, your consumer interface, that you know them and you make mm -hmm. their life easier and easier and easier. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, and, but doing it in a way that's not intrusive, that doesn't make them feel unsafe. Um, that will be the battle. But I, I, you know, just, I was doing something earlier that I was purchasing and I go there all the time and always have to put my birth date in. I, and I'm just like, don't you remember? Or, you know, my favorite <laughs> airline always knows I want a window seat. I shouldn't, if there's an open, they should put me there. But yep. it's like, I think technology, leveraging technology to make consumers' lives will continue to be a race, but not doing it in a way that it gets too prying and too, for people to feel unsafe. That will be the balance. 
Well, we're uh, we're at uh, six o'clock Chicago time. So I want to uh, thank you for taking the time to come uh, talk to everybody, Scott. I also want to uh, tell everybody, Scott's an incredible friend of the school. He serves on our Kill Steering Committee, always gives time back to talk to students uh, about sort of any questions they might have. Uh, wanted to say we're incredibly proud of everything you have accomplished and uh, wish you all the best going forward. Thanks again for taking the time to be with us today, Scott. Thank you very much for having me. A lot of fun. Good luck to you, everyone. All right. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.